Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, this opportunity to talk a little bit about my field of research. Since I'm the first one uh, talking about differential equations this far, I thought I would say just a few words about the general concept and then I'm going to talk about the particular problem or the particular field of problems that I uh, work on. And then at the end, maybe I'll say what uh, should be desired in the future um, for from this field. So in general, a partial differential equation is um, um, an equation that involves a function and its uh, derivatives up to any arbitrary finite order. And uh, uh, one can have a nonlinear function of all of these um, function and, un and the derivatives set to be equal to zero. This is the implicit form. One can probably also make it explicit by uh, explicitly getting the highest order term as a function of all the other ones in most cases. Uh, now, um, fully nonlinear um, partial differential equations are somewhat more difficult to tackle and also um, there are plenty of interesting models that result in uh, equations of uh, less difficulty from this point of view. So one starts with uh, linear equations. They are the simplest in some sense. Um, so they have the feature that the sum of two solutions is always a solution. Uh, they are generally somewhat well understood. Uh, the next uh, level of difficulty is uh, given by semilinear equations where one st starts from a linear equation, which is the main term, the highest order term, and then adds a linear perturbation, which can um, consist of arbitrarily many lower order terms. Um, so they are lower order terms in the number of derivatives, but they can be nonlinear. Uh, Quasi-linear uh, means that the equation is just linear in the highest order term. It is no longer obtained by simply by a perturbation of a linear equation because uh, the linear coefficients of this highest order term uh, can be themselves functions of the unknown and its derivatives of all or orders uh, except the last one. So for example here, the highest order term is the Laplacian. The coefficient of the Laplacian is uh, 2u and um, uh, therefore it is a uh, a quasi-linear equation. Uh, fully nonlinear equations are, as I said, uh, somewhat harder to understand. And an example is uh, uh, you take the determinant of the matrix constituted by uh, the second order derivatives of uh, a function and um, of the unknown and set it equal to some given function. Um, now, uh, this function uh, and the equ these equations in general uh, make sense uh, over, uh, first of all, over um, Rn, uh, and then, uh, of course, over um, various uh, manifolds. Um, and um, uh, sometimes we set the equation on the whole manifold. Sometimes we set it on just a, a portion of it. And then uh, one has some boundary conditions at the boundary of the domain, of the subdomain on that ma that we consider on that manifold. Um, so now one can have conditions all over the whole boundary or just on some portion of the boundary. Um, usually if one has con conditions on the whole boundary, then we are dealing with an elliptic equation. If one has conditions over just some portion of the boundary, uh, then uh, we are dealing with an uh, evolution equation. So if the, equation, uh, if, uh, the unknown function is a function of time, then it probably suffices to prescribe um, uh, the, uh, the unknown, the, uh, the initial data at the initial time, and then uh, let it evolve under the action of the equation and uh, see what one uh, obtains. Um, so um, now I'm going to make a, a big jump from uh, generality to a very specific case. Um, so and uh, one evolution equation that people consider is uh, Schrodinger's equation. Uh, Schrodinger's equation um, is um, given for complex valued functions either on manifolds or on Rn. Um, for example, here 
uh, this uh, this uh, is the physically meaningful case of three space dimensions and one uh, time dimension. Um, since this is a complex valued function, it, uh, I'm going to say that I here is the imaginary unit, uh, delta is the Laplacian, and this is a semi-linear equation because we start with the linear Schrodinger equation, which has uh, this form, and we add uh, one extra nonlinear term in um, the unknown function. Uh, what is the interest of doing that? Well, uh, physically, uh, we one starts uh, by looking probably at the simplest model, which is the linear Schrodinger equation. But the linear Schrodinger equation does not capture some uh, real-world phenomena because, uh, among other things, uh, all solutions of the linear Schrodinger equation um, decay uniformly at the same rate. Um, there, I there is no blow-up in finite time. Um, there are no persistent solutions. Uh, so uh, it is good uh, for, for a beginning. But then if one wants to uh, add the next layer of complexity, the simplest way of doing that is exactly this. So uh, this term appears as the first approximation. Um, I mean as the uh, first approximation following the linear approximation in uh, many physical models. Uh, generally, if one has a much more complicated function here on the right-hand side, then one performs a Taylor expansion of that and retains, uh, I mean, if one is a physicist, retains just the first term in that expansion, and it, it will be this term. Um, now, um, um, so this equation already is, has uh, uh, all the complications of nonlinear equations, but at the same time, it also has some simple features that make it nice to study. Uh, and one of them is uh, the fact that it has a, it has a scaling. So uh, if one multiplies um, the space coordinate by a certain amount and the time coordinate by the square of that amount, uh, that accounts for the fact that we have two, der two space derivatives and one time derivative, um, then uh, the equation is preserved. Um, this fact indicates to us that the equation should be studied in a certain norm and uh, that norm is the homogeneous uh, Sobolev norm of order one half. Uh, because uh, it has the exact scaling that corresponds to that norm. Okay, um, now things that uh, one would like to study about such equations are the local existence of solutions, the global in time existence of solutions, and one has different behaviors for small data and for large data, um, and uh, also the behavior of special solutions to the equation. As I said, one uh, um, bad feature of the linear equation is that there is no special solution. But uh, for example, if uh, one thinks, uh, if one wants to describe uh, elementary particles or something, then yes, one must distinguish certain solutions. And uh, um, this is the, simp the simplest equation that has such distinguished solutions and could serve as theoretical as a model for these more complicated physical issues. Okay, uh, so um, uh, now this equation comes from physics and therefore um, there are some uh, physically meaningful features of the equation. One of them is that the L2 norm, so the integral of the square of the absolute value of the function um, is, um, is preserved, is time independent. Um, so this corresponds, uh, since this is the Schrodinger equation, uh, this integral can be set to one, and it corresponds to the total probability of finding the particle at uh, some point in space. Um, also, uh, the, the linear equation uh, has uh, this feature that all solutions uh, decay uniformly at a uh, uh, fixed uh, time rate, t to the minus 3 halves. Um, local smoothing is uh, of a more uh, technical interest, so this says that the locally in time and space, the solution gains half a derivative. And uh, uh, a measure of the fact that the all, and so another measure of the fact that all solutions disperse is this uh, so-called Strichardt's estimate, which is uh, somewhat more technical, but very helpful in actually studying and understanding the equation. Uh, so uh, now uh, for, um, now going back to, now going back to the semilinear equation, for small data, uh, the solution behaves exactly like the solution of uh, 
the linear equation because uh, if the data is sufficiently small, then the nonlinearity is of higher orders and it can be treated as a perturbation of the linear equation. For large initial data, uh, one has uh, local well posedness, uh, which means that um, the solution exists for <laughs> some time, which depends on the profile and not only on the norm of the initial data. And this is uh, considering uh, the critical norm. Um, now, uh, as I said, uh, there are some uh, meaningful conserved quantities. One of them is the mass, which could be set to one, and the uh, uh, mass is somewhat of a misnomer because uh, we actually mean the total probability of finding the particle at some point in space. Integrating over the whole space, this should be equal to one. Then there is the energy, which actually refers to uh, the energy of the particle, and it's given by the, by the sum of the uh, kinetic and the potential energy. And the momentum, which... Uh, Yes, actually measures the momentum of the particle. Uh, and um, uh, again, for the um, uh, semi-linear equation, uh, the solution can blow up in finite time, as shown by Glassy in 1977. This uh, can be seen to follow from a simple identity. If the function is sufficiently rapidly decaying at infinity, then one can consider this quantity, which is, I think, called the virial. And, uh, uh, one uh, and taking the uh, double time derivative of this quantity, one obtains um, one obtains uh, the energy minus something. If the energy is negative, then uh, uh, this would eventually force this positive quantity to become negative, which cannot happen. So it has a finite amount of existence. Um, now, um, another interesting feature of the equation, and wha the one that I'm studying is uh, the existence of soliton type solutions, which are given by a stationary function times uh, an oscillating complex phase. And uh, this stationary function is a solution of the so-called time-independent Schrodinger equation, which is written here. Um, and uh, it has a number of nice features. Uh, I am not going to go into details. Uh, now. Um, uh, this, this equation has a number of, um, um, in of invariants. Um, so it's invariant under Galilean coordinate changes, under complex phase change, and under skin. The first one of these has physical meaning, and um, it actually refers to changes of speed and position. Uh, this, the Schrodinger equation is non relativistic. This is why these are Galilean coordinate changes, not of relativistic coordinate changes. And um, the second one is the simplest example of uh, uh, the so-called uh, gauge invariance. And uh, I, I'm not going to say more about this because I don't actually know much about it. And the third one is, uh, as I said, uh, uh, c comes from the fact that this is a simple uh, model which is nice to study. So most equations don't have a particular scaling, but this one does. Um, so in total, this means that if we rescale the soliton, move them, or uh, uh, shift them by some complex phase, they still remain solitons. And we in general, we obtain a, an eight-dimensional manifold of solitons. It's a smooth manifold. It can be described very explicitly. Uh, so now, um, one interesting question is whether solitons are stable under small perturbations. Um, and uh, this has been shown in... Uh, uh, how much time do I have left? Okay. So this has it has been shown in 1981 that solitons are not stable under small perturbations, but uh, uh, this was done ex explicitly by constructing um, a solution in a s in a close neighborhood of the soliton that blow that blowed up in finite time. It is even more interesting to know what happens for a generic perturbation of the soliton, whether they are stable under such perturbations. And uh, it turns out that they are not, that uh, there are actually two unstable directions. So uh, if we linearize the equation around the soliton, um, so if we, uh, I mean, if we expand the solution as a Taylor uh, sum around the soliton and we give up on all higher order terms, uh, then uh, we obtain that uh, uh, 
the solution is unstable. First of all, it has a linear instability corresponding to the existence of other solitons in the neighborhood of the first soliton we started with. And it also has an exponential instability, which leads uh, exponentially fast away from the soliton manifold as soon as one steps away in the wrong direction. Um, so, um, okay, uh, then I'm going to um, skip some of this and go straight to the final picture. This is uh, how um, this is how the space of solutions looks in a neighborhood of a soliton. So uh, first at the center, one has um, one has uh, the solid the a-dimensional soliton manifold. Um, and around it, actually, uh, the space of solutions is split more or less into four uh, open set regions, uh, which uh, between which one has um, four boundary portions on each of which the solution has a distinct behavior. So in total, there are nine different regions. Uh, the solitons are stable for all time. Um, then there is one region around the soliton on which the solution blows up uh, both going forward and backward in time. An another zone on which the solution scatters, uh, so behaves like the solution of the linear equation, both backward and forward in time. And then there are two other solutions, uh, two other regions in which the solution exhibits a mixed behavior. As one, one goes forward in time, the solution blows up. As one goes backward in time, it's, it uh, scatters, or the other way around. And uh, there is a, a, a time uh, reversal symmetry in uh, the equation. Namely, if one replaces the variable t by minus t and one takes the conjugate of the solution, then one is still dealing with a solution. So we expect the same thing happening, uh, one going forward and backward in time, except for the conjugate of that uh, solution. Now, uh, uh, my work is uh, actually more uh, concerned with what happens on the boundary between these uh, manifolds, so uh, between these uh, open regions, sorry. So it turns out that uh, the boundary is um, an analytic, a real analytic manifold. And uh, uh, on uh, this boundary, one has um, that, let's say, at least at one time, and as time goes forward or backward to infinity, uh, the solution, um, instead of uh, behaving like a linear solution or of blowing up in time, uh, sorry, uh, I'm pointing, I guess, to these uh, boundaries, which are the uh, these manifolds, which are the boundaries between these regions. And it, uh, I left some open space between these and these regions because it is not exactly known uh, how uh, they come together uh, at the solid. Um, and um, but there are some new results about this, and uh, I'm not going to mention them. Uh, so in any case, on these manifolds, the solution does not disperse, does not blow up, but it decomposes into a term that looks like the soliton and a term that disperses. So between, um, uh, between these two generic behaviors of blowing up and dispersion, there is a codimension one um, interface on which uh, one sees uh, an intermediate behavior. Okay, and uh, now I want to say what uh, one of my possible goals for this year would be at the Institute, and that would be, um, I should mention that this picture only holds in a neighborhood of the soliton locally, and uh, some of the results, but not all, are proved by perturbative means. So by writing uh, the solution of the, as the sum of some soliton plus something small. So where the sm emphasis is on small. So it would be interesting to obtain more such results in a non-perturbative regime for data which is not necessarily very close to the solution. And uh, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much.